<laughs> so uh, to, to get us started this morning, uh, I actually have to uh, offer a quick public correction to something I said in last week's sermon. Um, I said, uh, I was describing uh, the shape and the structure of church buildings, sort of historically, as they've been built. Um, and I said that, that through much of church history, churches have been built with their doors opening toward the east. And I was wrong, um, which several people in my small group seemed super excited to point out to me, because they're my friends, they love me. Um, <laughs> throughout history, churches that have been built and oriented uh, theologically were built with the altar uh, toward the east so that you would face the east, uh, the direction of Christ returning um, in, in your worship. Uh, in some ways, it's kind of funny, uh, interesting that, that this is the correction that I have to start with because as we jump into our Ezekiel passage this week, um, our, our passage starts with an altar, and so if you have your Bibles and you, if you would open to Ezekiel 43, our passage starts in verse 13. And Ezekiel is, is jumping back into uh, this, this long and elaborate uh, uh, re retelling of a vision that God has given him of this, this glorious new temple. And in verse 13, uh, here's what we read. Ezekiel says, These are the measurements of the altar by cubits. The cubit being a cubit and a handbreadth. Its base shall be one cubit high and one cubit broad with a rim of one span around its edge. And this shall be the height of the altar from the base on the ground to the lower ledge, two cubits with a breadth of one cubit. And from the smaller ledge to the larger ledge, four cubits with a breadth of one cubit. Are you guys all hooked? Riveting, right? Uh, it's nail biting stuff. Like, man, I've been dying to know how big this altar is going to be. What are they going to do with it? What, as you can imagine, the altar uh, in this vision is used for the exact same thing that altars have always been used for. Burnt offerings, sin offerings, you know, taking animals and offering them before God. The altar is a place for fellowship between God and his people. It, it, it's the place where, where sin is dealt with. The, the altar is where we, we demonstrate our trust in God and we respond to his invitation to come and meet with him. Which raises a question, which I've actually heard a number of people raising as we've been in these last eight chapters in Ezekiel. If this vision of a temple represents God's final and perfect dwelling place, and if God is dwelling with his people in perfect unity, why is an altar necessary? Why is there sin to deal with? What, what's going on here? And I, and I hope to offer some sort of a satisfying answer by the time we're done. Um, but, this, but to set the stage, I, I want to tell you about an experience that I had a few weeks ago. Um, I had this cool opportunity uh, to sit with uh, the core team of, of a church plant. And um, and this team is considering joining up with uh, the Church of the Nazarene. And so they wanted to meet with, talk with a, a Nazarene pastor about what uh, being Nazarene means. And so they asked me, what do you appreciate about the Church of the Nazarene? Um, they also asked me what frustrates me about the church. And I gave them some honest answers, and those are for another day. Um, but this, this morning's passage is related to what I really appreciate about our denomination and the larger tradition that we find ourselves in. And so I gave this group of church planners this answer. I, I deeply appreciate that our tradition carries an intense belief in God's ability to transform us. We call ourselves Wesleyans because John Wesley, in many ways, uh, recovered this important doctrine for the Protestant church. And, and the official doctrine goes by different names, but, but essentially we believe that, that along, we believe along with the early church, like we share this belief with, 
with the earliest writers uh, of Christian theology that God is able to make us holy as he is holy. That God is able to perfect love in us. That he is able to sanctify us completely. That, that he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, Paul says in Philippians and then to the Ephesians, Paul tells us that, that God is at work in us, maturing us to, to what, Mark? To the measure of the standard of the fullness of Christ. And that we then are to be imitators of God, walking in love just as Christ has loved us. Wesley was clear that Christian holiness is a, a thoroughly biblical doctrine. Um, and, I'm and I'm moved by the way um, a guy named E.G. Rupp describes Wesley's theology. I've got this quote um, that will be up here. Wesley, he said, had a pessimism of nature and an optimism of grace. In, in other words, Wesley was super skeptical pessimistic about what humans could do left to their own nature. But Wesley was abounding, overflowing in optimism when dealing in matters of God's grace. This is significant because it says that, that Wesley's hopeful belief that, that we could become holy people who live holy lives and isn't dependent on, on some human strength or goodness found within ourselves, that we don't become holy because we want it bad enough or because we try hard enough. We become holy by grace, which is a gift from God. Holiness is a gift from God. Holiness being, means being filled with the life of God himself. Holiness is to be made like God. And if God promises our holiness, we ought to be infinitely optimistic about what his grace can accomplish in us. And so I told these church planting friends, the church of the Nazarene lives within the legacy of John Wesley's optimism. We believe that God can make us holy. We believe that God is making us holy. It's interesting to me how Wesley came to this belief. Um, Wesley is said to have become passionate about holiness by reading the early church fathers. Um, those who were writing in the years um, just after the apostles had all died. During, during Wesley's day, um, there was a, a broad or general uh, pessimism of nature and a pessimism of grace. Um, th th there was a common idea that, that grace, the grace of God was powerful to save. But predominantly in the future. Until then, the idea was that, that we are faced with lives full of sin, sinning in thought and word and in deed every day, constantly until we die. There's not much hope for anything other than this. But Wesley couldn't uh, find in the church fathers any sort of this sort of like, woe is me, we just keep sinning over and over stuff. In fact, he found just the opposite. He found this radical belief that God is remaking us, enabling us to bear his image in the world. Um, one of the, the early Christian writers that Wesley was, was reading is uh, a guy named Irenaeus. Um, our earliest writings tell us that Irenaeus was the spiritual grandson of John, the disciple of Jesus. So, so John, one of the 12, discipled a man named Polycarp who discipled Irenaeus. <coughs> I, 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 want you to, I want you to hear what Irenaeus said. And I've got this quote up here too. The word of God our Lord Jesus Christ, who did through his transcendent love 
become what we are, that he might bring us to be even what he is himself. I want you to just hear this one more time. I want you to consider the question that often gets asked this time of year. Why did Jesus come? Why did the word of God take on human flesh and dwell among us? Irenaeus says, the word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who did through his transcendent love become what we are. That because of his immense love, he became what we are. He became human so that he might bring us to be even what he is himself. He became human so that we might become like him, a child of God. Sons and daughters of the Most High God, so that, that we might find our lives bound to the Father, united with the Father, one with the Father, holy like the Father, like Him in every way. So sometimes you'll hear people say that Jesus came to die so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Yes, and Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus was raised from the dead so that now we are no longer in our sins. Not only are we forgiven of our sin, but we have been set free from slavery to sin and the power of sin and mastery of sin. This is incredible news. This is why our passage this morning in Ezekiel tells us about an altar in the future temple. When, when God makes his dwelling among us, we quickly discover that, oh, there's not a future temple. There is Jesus, the dwelling place of God and the church, the people in whom the spirit of God dwells. When God makes his dwelling among us, he deals with our sin. He has to. He promises forgiveness. But our passage doesn't stop at the altar in our passage this morning, we have three groups of, um, of people who are named and described. We have princes, and we have priests, and we have people, just people who are not priests or princes. <laughs> and all of them are being transformed. Uh, perhaps the most obvious example, because it's in some ways the most explicit, are, are the princes. All you have to do is take a quick trip down memory lane. We've, we've read these stories together to recall that Israel's rulers have always been awful. Even the good ones were still corrupted by their power and their position and often oppressed their people, misused their power. And so turn with me to chapter 45. And we'll reread a bit of what Penny read for us earlier. <clears throat> Ezekiel says, thus says the Lord God. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. That was bound to happen. Okay, here we go. Oh, they both start the same, so that's convenient. Oh, nine. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions while we're at it? <laughs> um, 45, verse 9. I think I'm in the right place. Thus says the Lord God. Here we go. Enough, O princes of Israel. Put away violence and oppression. Execute justice and righteousness. Cease your evictions of my people, declares the Lord. You shall have just balances, a just ephah, and a just bath. So these instructions, if you have been reading the story of Israel, are given as an obvious comparison to some of the most obvious and blatant uh, perversions of the prince's rule throughout Israel's history. One of the most common practices of Israel's rulers is that they would use their power to take land from, from, from ordinary citizens. 
They would make laws. They would uh, make decrees. They would uh, fix the fix the the elder support in a community to win, to get, to gain, to steal land from ordinary people. And so they would expand their wealth and they would expand their position among the people, sort of enslaving, indebting their own people to them while taking from their people the ability to even make a living. In the Old Testament, to have land was the most basic uh, sort of means of economic survival. And rulers cared so little about the people that were entrusted to them that they would take that land for themselves. The story of Israel tells us again and again that rulers ruled with violence. Hey, thanks. I'm guessing that says something about my voice or... <laughs> That's soothing. <laughs> Thanks, Whitney. And Janet. Um, the rulers ruled with violence. They used violence against their own people to keep them in line. They oppressed the vulnerable, those who were the weakest in their midst. Um, the First Testament often uses the language of widows and orphans and foreigners those who had no ability to establish a life for themselves, rulers would take advantage of. They also cheated people by using weighted measures. So when you're, when you're in power and you have the ability to set the sort of trade standards among people, uh, if you are so inclined, to use your own special weights, your own special measures to make sure that when you're bartering with people, you get a better deal. Uh, this is what the rulers of Israel did as common practice. It's just no, ordinary, normal. It, it, it's like when we read the newspaper and we find out that some leader has done something immoral. Like there's a sense in which we go, well, yeah, of course they do. Like that's kind of become normal. Like we just sort of expect it. This is the way that it was for the princes of Israel. And here in these chapters, God is announcing that in his holy presence, something dramatic is going to change. Not only will the princes of Israel bring offerings and be forgiven of their sins, but, but they will now do their work faithfully described as injustice and in righteousness. They, they will live and they will serve out of the character of God. John Wesley looked around during his day and he didn't see many people who believed that this sort of thing was possible. See, in Wesley's day, as the Protestant Reformation had been underway for a few years, um, each sort of new branch of Christianity was vying not just for status as like the truest form of the Christian faith, but these were also political battles. Whole nations were often identified with a single uh, denomination. And so you have Christian rulers using violence against their people oppressing the vulnerable, cheating people, using weighted measures. Christian rulers sound just like kings of Israel. But Wesley recognized in the early church, these, these fathers he was, he was reading had the same optimism of grace that he had found in the scriptures. And, and he had this sense that, that he had been tasked with bringing back what had been lost along the way. Now, now, clearly this wasn't lost to all of the church, but specifically within Protestantism. I, and I often wonder for us today, how many of us hold Wesley's optimism of grace? 
I occasionally get asked what's the, the hardest part of uh, pastoral ministry. Uh, sometimes the question is asked in regards to like, what's the thing or is there a thing that like discourages me or, or makes me uh, question my calling? Um, the, the, way, the simple way that it gets asked makes me want to resign on Monday morning. Um, my answer is almost always the same. And there are kind of two parts to it. And just this isn't, this isn't descriptive of our church. It's just my experience in the church. And I would say these two things. It is the unholiness of the church. And it's the lack of desire for holiness among God's people. We're just too busy to be holy. We want too many other things. We constantly make excuses for our unholiness. So often we are more concerned with who I feel that I am, far more concerned than with who Jesus says that I am. And we look at the gifts that God has given us. Some traditions call them means of grace. Others call them spiritual disciplines, practices. These gifts that open us to having Christ formed in us. And, and we just often decide that they're just too hard or too time consuming and too much effort to learn, to practice, to cultivate. But really the heart of all of this at the center is that I, I think what keeps Christian people um, sort of passive and sort of settled in unholiness is that, that we have grown comfortable with keeping God at a distance. The God who has made his dwelling among us, who has drawn near to us in Jesus and who now dwells in us by means of his spirit. God's movement is toward us. And if you read scripture, you will, you will hear again and again that our instinctive movement is back. To draw back, to step away. In our sin, we hide in shame so that we stand at a distance, afraid of what might happen to us in the presence of a holy God. We so often can't receive the forgiveness that has been given to us freely in Christ. And so we don't pursue God. It's interesting that we can do things with God's name on them without pursuing God. And the people of God have always struggled to see the difference. And so we end up passively existing as though forgiveness is all God has for us. And so the question I ask you this morning as we continue to move through Advent, is do you believe that God made us to be holy? Uh, some of you have heard me talk about um, and probably never stop talking about one of uh, the best and I think most important books that I've ever read. Uh, <clears throat> when I find a book I like, I just happen to talk about it a lot. Um, but I had our church board read it uh, last year um, and several other people have picked it up over, over time. Um, and it's called The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. And one of the book's main ideas is that the early church went around the Roman Empire announcing that Yeshua a Jewish guy who was crucified by the Romans is king of the whole world. <laughs> it doesn't really preach in most contexts. This is what they were announcing. Jesus is Lord over Caesar. Lord over Rome. Lord over all creation. A guy that Caesar and Rome had put to death successfully 
So as the church made this bold assertion that Jesus had been <laughs> raised from the dead and now sits at the right hand of the Father, you can imagine that people hearing this announcement of good news would like to know why they should believe this is true because they can't see Jesus. Oh, how convenient that this Jesus that was raised from the dead is now in heaven where we can't see him. They were looking for some proof, for some evidence. We get that, right? And the early church for nearly 300 years offered one bit of evidence. The holiness of the church. That, that, that's kind of terrifying for us today. Because if we were trying to convince our neighbor that they should trust that Jesus is Lord over all creation, how many of us would point to the church as evidence? How often are we apologizing for the church? The holiness of the church. Jesus is holy. These Preachers of the good news declared, he is holy. He is a God unlike any of the other gods known in the Roman world. How can you know this? Look at the church. They said, if you want to believe that Jesus is Lord, look at the church. See, look at how they live. Look at how they risk their lives for their enemies. Look at how they stand and love in the face of hatred and persecution Look at how they care for each other. Look at how they refuse to grasp for power. Look at how they pray with such confidence. Look at how they conduct business in the marketplace. Look at how they take babies born and abandoned on garbage piles. This was common practice in the ancient world. Rescue them and then adopt them into their own families. Look at the faithfulness they show in their marriages. Look, look at how they meet together before work and after work during a time when pretty much all you did was work. In all of these ways, the people in the early church refused to live according to Caesar's values. They refused to live the values of Rome. They were living in ways that made no sense to the world or to their gods. And none of this is possible by human effort. Their conviction was that no one would desire to live in these ways. We love the idea of a community that cares for each other when we are the one receiving that care. And sometimes we like to offer some care. But what's the limit on that care? What is the, the level at which all of a sudden the care that I'm giving to this community, uh, I'm not really getting out of it what I've put in. We start to figure out equations. We start to determine, I'm caring a lot and I'm being asked to care more. How much is too much? There's nothing in us that would motivate us to care for each other to the depths that is found in the early church. This is grace. This is grace alone that sets us free from our selfishness, our self-centeredness, and enables us to give our lives away so that others might live and be free. This, the early church had been transformed by living constantly in the presence of their holy God. And this is the key. Like, they weren't trying to be really holy. They were trying to be as close to their God as they could, seeking him, drawing near to him, knowing that he had already come near to him. They didn't have to look far. Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am. And so these people were becoming humans, unlike any humans the world had ever seen, except for the human we know as Jesus. They were becoming humans who live and love like God, like Jesus. 
they were becoming lights. They were shining brightly in the world. But again, this isn't their own light or by their own power. It wasn't their own love. It wasn't their own holiness. This comes from a nearness to the holy God who transforms us by his very presence. This is is what our passage this morning is testifying to. When God makes his dwelling among us, his holiness, holiness radiates through us and we find ourselves being restored. And so we stop looking to our neighbors to define our lives. Princes don't learn how to prince from other princes. Priests don't learn how to do the work of priests by looking at how others are priesting. People don't learn how to live by looking at at people who trust and follow other gods. Princes live and serve and rule and step with the Prince of Peace who dwells in their midst. And priests live and serve and teach like our great high priest who is with us always. And, And people live and serve and worship like the human one who continues to be in our presence. And it's, it's worth noting that in, Eze- in this passage in Ezekiel, Ezekiel describes princes and priests and people. These are the three categories of people all being restored to their humanity and to their ability to do the job that they were made for. Well, here's what the New Testament tells us. There is now no separation between prince and priest and people. If Jesus is the true prince and priest and the true person, we, with him and under him, have become a royal priesthood, the New Testament says. We have been made kings and queens and priests. We have been given work to do in the world Jesus came to make us holy, to make our work holy. But all of this starts in the presence of our holy God. And this morning, he invites us to his table to share in a meal with him once again. He became like us so that we might become like him. Can you hear him inviting you today to see, to recognize his presence in our midst? Can you open yourself to his presence and be transformed by his holiness? The invitation is open to come and be with him. If our servers would come